Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Vallabha Kiri Varadhari Gopi Janna Vallabha Kiri Varadhari Yasura Nandana Braja Jananan Janna Yasura Nandana Braja Jananan Janna Jamuna Tiravana Chari Munatira Anachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kupi Janna Vallabha Kiri Varadhari Kupi Janna Vallabha Kiri Varadhari Yasura Nandana Braja Janna Nandana Yasura Nandana Braja Janna Nandana Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Unja Bihari Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Mishnupad Paramahamsa Paribraja Kacharya Asto Tara Sata Sri Sri Madhis Gdain Gari Sabai Chana Nara 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 Shishi Gorni Tai Ki Shishi Radha Dari Ki Shri Krishna Balaram Shri Giri Raja Govardhana Ki Gora Premanandi Oh, glories to the assembled devotees Oh, glories to the assembled devotees Oh, glories to the assembled devotees Oh, glories, oh, glories to Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda 
Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Raita Chandra Jai Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, Chapter 16, Text Number 32 Vyakarana Madhye I'll do, I'll do the whole line, sorry. I meant to do the whole line. Vyakarana Madhye Jani Padaha Kalapa Shuni Lun Prakite Tomara Shishera Samlapaha Vyakarana Madhye Jani Padaha Kalapa Shuni Lun Prakite Tomara Shishira Samlapaha Someone else? Vaishnavis? Yakarana Madhye Among grammars Jani I understand. Padaha, you teach. Kalapa, the Kalapa Vyakarana. Shunilun, I have heard. Prakite, excuse me. Funkite, in deceitful word jugglery. Tomara, your Shishera of the disciples. Samlapa, the specific knowledge. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. I understand that you teach Kalapa Vyakarana. I have heard that your students are very expert in the word juggery of this grammar. Please repeat. I understand that you teach Kalapa Vyakarana. I have heard that your students are very expert in the word juggery of this grammar. Purport. There are many schools of grammar in the Sanskrit language. The most famous of which are the systems of Panini and the Kalapa and Kumudi grammars. There were different branches of grammatical knowledge and a student of grammar was supposed to study them all in 12 years. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was famous as Nimai Pandit, taught grammar to his students who became expert in dealing with the word juggery of complicated grammar. Almost anyone expert in studying grammar interprets the Shastras in many ways by changing the root meanings 
of their words. A student of grammar can sometimes completely change the meaning of a sentence by juggling grammatical rules. Keshava Kashmiri indirectly taunted Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by implying that although he was a great teacher of grammar, such grammatical jugglery of root meanings did not require great expertise. This was a challenge to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because it was prearranged that Keshava Kashmiri would have to discuss the Shastras with Nimai Pandit. From the very beginning, he wanted to bluff the Lord. Thus, the Lord replied as follows. Omagyana timanandasya gananjana shalakaya chakshu unmanitam jena tasmai sri gurave namaha. I'm going to recite one other verse which we're very fond of at the moment. Oh, very applicable. One of the most famous verses in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Arajo Bhagavan Brajesha Tamayas Tadama Vrindavan Ramya Kachit Upashana Vraja Badha Vag Ena Ba Kalpita Srimad Bhagavatam Pramanam Amalam Premam Pumarta Mohan Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Matamidam Tatrad Ara Na Paraha The object of worship Aradya is the Lord in his form as the son of the king of Braja. His abode is Vrindavan, and the cowherd girls who live there with him, chief amongst whom is Radhika, are his perfect worshippers, or Samradikas. The most enchanting method of worshipping the Supreme Lord is that devised by these gopis. The most authoritative source of divine revelation is the Srimad Bhagavatam. Love for Krishna or Prema is the fifth and ultimate goal of human life. These are the basic principles of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's belief, and we thus consider this doctrine to be supreme. Chanakya Pandit said one time, every day memorize a verse, or at least half a verse, or at least one line of a verse. Uh, good instruction, of course, some of us have gotten a little old now for memorizing uh, verses but um, at least we can still read them and uh, recite invoking auspiciousness so this is a very famous pastime uh, this chapter is entitled the pastimes uh, of childhood and youth of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he is famous as Nimai Pandit and this is of course uh, involving uh, Keshava Kashmiri famous Pandit Brahmana from that's going to be a little distracting if that uh, yeah that phone going off whoever's it is so let me just if that's okay thank you um, so and there uh, there is another very famous pastime um, around this time in Mahaprabhu's life and that um, involves uh, one contemporary. A fellow student of Nimai Pandit, Lord Chaitanya, uh, who the Lord went to school with, studied with, um, and his name is Raghunath Shiromani. And you can, and I'm seeing some of our Indian devotees nodding their heads in uh, recollection and agreement because he's still a very famous person in India. And a quick search will bring up his name immediately as um, a great uh, philosopher and logician in India's history. And his birth, his appearance and disappearance days are given there, which uh, directly correspond. Though he lived a little longer than Mahaprabhu, but he definitely appeared around the same time, and they were school friends together. And, um, and uh, there's a wonderful pastime of uh, Raghunath Shuramani and Mahaprabhu when they were both students. They were attending different schools, studying logic, and uh, of course, Mahaprabhu had his own school teaching grammar, as um, Keshava Kashmiri has recognized here. Um, Raghunath Siramani was very ambitious, and uh, he was a very bright student, uh, had a phenomenal intellect. And as was the case in uh, those times, Brahm young Brahmin men, boys, um, would. Uh, 
go on to earn their living um, as teachers and many would specialize in one or another of the different many branches of Vedic learning um, and in that way also gain uh, wealth and reputation it's said that Krishna goes to a great deal of trouble to create the material universes and there's three reasons for that for rebellious jivas who want to live separately from the Lord Krishna fulfills their aspirations in three different primary ways and one of those is our desire to enjoy sense pleasure separate from him and also our desire for reputation to gain some uh, fame in this world and when one becomes disillusioned with with those two uh, then one can aspire for liberation moksha or mukti uh, emancipation from the cycle the repetition of birth and death so uh, Raghunath Suramani he very much had a he was ambitious and he had a desire to uh, become famous as a great logician so he'd written one book it just so happened that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had also written a book on logic and one day the two students were sharing a, a boat ride back to their homes across the Ganga and Lord Chaitanya said to Raghunath I've written one small book on logic would you care to read it and perhaps give me your opinion so Raghunath Suramani read the book during the course of their boat ride and then at the end of reading Mahaprabhu's short treatise um, he appeared very unhappy and Mahaprabhu was uh, see, sad to see his friend so sad and he said my dear Raghunath what is the cause of your unhappiness and Raghunath admitted that I've also written one book but it just pales into insignificance uh, compared to this book you've written and just given me so Lord Chaitanya being very munificent he immediately threw his own book in the Ganga never to be seen again and uh, Raghunath Suramani did go on to become famous to this day as a great logician and philosopher in India so a uh, wonderful little pastime there of Lord Chaitanya's um, so yes they were attending schools in Navadweep together um, some say the, uh, the higher education, Vidya Vachaspati, who was either a brother or a student of Sarvabhauma Bhattacharya. And we know Sarvabhauma Bhattacharya originally lived in Navadweep and was teaching there, but when the king of Puri, uh, Maharaj Prataparudra, heard of the phenomenal erudition of Sarvabhauma Bhattacharya, he invited him to come and live as his chief pundit Raj Pandit in Puri and Sababoma Bhattacharya agreed to do that and that um, but he never forgot his early days in Navadweep and upon the first glorious meeting between Sababoma Bhattacharya and Lord Chaitanya when it was revealed that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, was coming from the land of Nadia um, and his father's name was Jagannath Misra then Savabhama Bhattacharya revealed to the Lord that um, I knew your grandfather very well. We were good friends, Nilambara Chakravati, the father of Sachimata. So there was a connection there, which was very wonderful. So, uh, and he, and Lord Chaitanya gave uh, Raghunath Shuramani a blessing. He said, let your work be glorified throughout the world. So that is still there today. So, uh, and as Prabhupada has mentioned, some verses back in olden days, Brahmin boys would um, study very hard and become famous. And Prabhupada does the comparison that in the modern world, young men um, quite often compete on the sports field and then become famous and fabulously wealthy by becoming uh, uh, great sportsmen. So... Um, Mm. Uh, and it is interesting amongst, uh, amongst our Goswamis Prabhupada does refer to them as the band of Goswamis uh, one only 
was not born in the Brahmin caste. Anyone can tell me which of the six Goswamis was not a born Brahmin? Yes, Nishan. Thank you very much. Raghunath Das Goswami was uh, born in a Kayasta family, which in Bengal at the time was considered like a Sudra family. Even though, he, from our estimation, uh, his father and uncle owned extensive lands which were highly productive and they were earning fabulous wealth from the cultivation of crops and cow protection on their land. Um, mm. uh, but still, uh, they were considered sudras, so Raghunath Das appeared. But it's interesting because Sambanda, Abhidaya, and Prayojana. He is our Prayojana Acharya, Raghunath Das Goswami, but he wasn't born in a Brahmin family. Um, but as we heard so nicely the other day, Mahaprabhu's munificence is that he, uh, he doesn't see uh, a person's birth or um, activities previous to taking up serious Krishna consciousness. Mm. And Raghunath Das is unique in the sense that, according to Chaitanya Charitamrita, he was one of the first intimate associates of Mahaprabhu, who the Lord actually gave his own Govardhan Shila to, to worship, which is very significant. Uh, and we know the story that soon after Mahaprabhu uh, relocated to Jagannath Puri, Raghunath Das came and joined him. And Mahaprabhu immediately placed him in the care of Sarup Damada, his secretary. So he became known as the uh, Raghuvera Swarup, the, the, uh, the servant, or Sarup Raghuvera. The, um, the, the Raghunath of uh, Surup Damada, who acted as his instructing spiritual master. Uh, and of course, he definitely got wonderful personal instructions from Mahaprabhu as well, not to eat very opulently, not to dress very luxuriously, um, and he followed those instructions very strictly his entire life. But when both Mahaprabhu and uh, Sarup Damada passed away, he was feeling such intense separation that he decided to leave Navadweep and to go and live uh, the rest of his life uh, in Vrindavan, in the vicinity of uh, Radhakunda and Govardhan. And, um, of course, it was there that uh, he was requested by Rupa and Sanatan and other Goswamis to uh, daily recite the latter pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which he'd been most fortunate to personally observe or to hear from Sri Damada. So he did like that. And, of course, Krishna Das Kaviraj was there at that time, and he's often considered as a shiksha disciple of Raghunath Das Goswami. So he heard very attentively, and uh, later on he was requested, you please write this Chaitanya Charitamrita. So uh, it's such a wonderful uh, uh, movement, the, uh, the movement of Mahaprabhu and his associates, uh, we have many wonderful acharyas. Srila Rupa Goswami is universally accepted as the Rasa Acharya. Uh, for our new devotees or guests, kindly giving up some of their precious time this morning to hear, we'll try to just explain some of these very esoteric terms. The word Rasa means relationship. Just as we have relationships with one another, um, we have our God family, God brothers, God sisters, God nephews, uh, God nieces. We have our Gurudev, spiritual fathers, spiritual grandfathers, and so on. 
And in the family life, of course, we're, many of us are parents, we have our children, grandchildren, and so on. So uh, there is also uh, relationships, spiritual relationships between Krishna and uh, every jiva. And just as this world is sometimes described as a perverted reflection of the spiritual world, so similarly in the spiritual realm, Krishna's abode, and also when the Lord appears in this realm, we see a wonderful flourishing dynamic of these relationships between the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his devotees, irrespective of caste or creed. So Rupa Goswami is very famous as the Rasa Acharya. Um, and he's wonderfully described these relationships which Krishna has, um, either passive, neutral relationship, or servitude, or friendship, parental affection, conjugal love, uh, in his wonderful book, uh, Nectar of Devotion, um, Bhakti Ras Amrita Sindhu. So some other prominent acharyas we often read about, uh, and they have their honorific titles as well. And foremost amongst those are known as Tattva acharyas, uh, Srila Jiva and Srila Baladeva Jibhusana. They're known as Tattva acharyas. Tattva means truth. And in Vaishnavism we have two very broad paths, if you like, uh, one is known as tattva vichar, which means philosophical search for the absolute truth. And that's generally followed by Vaishnavas um, of other sampradayas um, based on their in-depth study of Vedanta Sutra. But they also study Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas, Upanishads, very broad, but primarily um, following a Vedanta Sutra, so a philosophical search for the absolute truth. And then we have the Gaudiya perspective, or very mercifully revealed to the world by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that is known as Rasatmika, which is devotees of Krishna are more interested. They've come to the conclusion, yes, Krishna is the supreme absolute truth. So now I want to hear about the Lord and his associates, his foremost associates, his devotees, what the Lord does, his interactions with his great devotees. Um, so that is the foremost thrust, if you like, of the canon of philosophical works left behind by the Goswamis. And of course, it's already there in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Vedic literatures. And there's a wonderful pastime in Brihat Bhagavat Amrita, which we know consists of part one and part two. Part one, both are quests. Part two is Gopa Kumara, a simple cowherd boy from Govardhan who meets a guru who initiates him into the Gopal Mantra, but doesn't tell him very much. So from that point on, Gopal Kumara's quest is to find the Ishta Dev, the worshipable Lord of his life and the mantra that he's chanting. But part one is Narad's quest uh, to travel all over the universe, meeting many of the most exalted devotees of Krishna to find out who amongst them has the most of Krishna's mercy. And uh, he visits many different personalities there uh, in his sojourn to different planets. And at one point, um, he meets Hanuman. And he and Hanumanji are having wonderful discourses. And both are quite similar in, uh, in the sense that uh, they're both very strict brahmacharis. They never marry. And they're both vastly learned. And uh, Hanuman uh, gives Narad a little bit of advice because Narad is, after interviewing Hanuman, his next interviewees will be the Pandavas. So Hanuman cautions Narad, not that Narad needs the caution, but for the uh, business of pastime, he just reminds Narad that don't think 
that because we're very strict brahmacharis and we're not involved in any uh, household affairs or mundane activities whatsoever, that just because these Pandavas are, appear externally to be uh, worldly men, uh, they have numerous wives, they live in palatial buildings, they have armies, they from time to time have to go and fight battles, they're constantly dealing in uh, politics and diplomacy. Don't think that they aren't as dear to Krishna as us renunciants or others uh, performing very austere lives. Not at all. They're very dear to Krishna. Um, and another example of that was when Yudhisthira Maharaj uh, had to perform a Rajasuya Jagya. He was advised when finally the dust had settled, literally, from the great battle of Kurukshetra. And all of the Pandavas' advisors, including the Supreme Lord, Krishna himself, said, now you're the emperor of the whole world, you need to perform this Rajasuya Jagya. And as we know, Arjuna had his epiphany moment, his crisis before the battle of Kurukshetra, where he didn't want to fight. Similarly, after the great battle, Yudhisthira Maharaj also had his crisis where he, for several months, refused to sit on the throne as the emperor of the world because he was feeling so remorseful that this great battle has taken place on my account uh, and so many, so many soldiers have lost their lives. Their, their, their wives are now widows, their children uh, are fatherless and uh, so he was feeling very, very r remorseful. Um, but eventually he agreed, yes, I will sit on the throne and everyone invite you have to perform this great sacrifice now, which as the name would imply, Raja Suya, sacrifice, it's only performed by great kings or emperors or great demigods. It uh, requires uh, almost unimaginable wealth and many, many Brahmins um, very well versed, and it goes on for a long time. So Yudhisthira Maharaj agreed, and he gave a number of different reasons. And one of the foremost reasons he gave to agreeing to do this was that he wanted the world to see what Krishna's devotees can achieve. What can be achieved by Krishna's devotees? Uh, they can even become uh, emperors of the whole world. Not that they're attached to those big positions, but they'll do it as a service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, so that was one, one reason that uh, he gave in that regard. So, um, of course, it's encouraging for us. Um, uh, many of us will no doubt spend the majority of our lifetimes in um, household life, and as Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has stated, that is the best ashram for aspiring Vaishnavas in this age of Kali. Um, and uh, we can achieve both spiritual perfection and, of course, um, live out our lives and fulfill our responsibilities um, in a gentlemanly way. I was reading the other day uh, the life of Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was married for 36 years. Interesting. Where in the modern world, couples, non devotee couples, uh, often, sadly, uh, lucky to stay together for 36 months. It's a sorry indi indictment on the age of Kali. Um, but Prabhupada was very dutiful, very dharmic person. And uh, he did um, act on the orders that he was given after a, a long time in the, uh, of course, during that time he was also active in the preaching field, 1944, I think he started back to Godhead magazine. And uh, 
Of course, there were approximately a dozen years after Prabhupada left household life and lived as both a Vanaprastha and a sannyasi, 12 years before he came to the Western world. And then there was an approximately another dozen years uh, of Prabhupada's colossal preaching worldwide. Um, so there we have a, a nice almost 25 years period in Prabhupada's life um, achieving what he did. Uh, it's sometimes said in the biographies of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati that he himself was planning and he intimated this that he himself wanted to go to the Western world and preach for a period of 10 years. And he was hoping that his disciples, who he sent to Europe in the 1930s, would establish something, and uh, then he would come um, and spend 10 years preaching Mahaprabhu's sublime teachings in the uh, Western world. And some consider that uh, he did achieve that through... Uh, the wonderful efforts of his dear most disciple, Srila Prabhupada, uh, that 10 plus 2, 12 years, 12 year period. So, hmm. and another interesting, just going back to Raghunath Das Goswami being the only of the band of six Goswamis not to be born in a Brahmin family, but yet being our Prayojana Acharya. Uh, for our guests, again, these terms, sambanda, relationship. Abhidaya means a reciprocation between the Lord and his devotee. And then prayojana means the fulfillment or the fruit of uh, that practice of bhakti yoga, which we're all doing, for whom Raghunath Das Goswami is the acharya. So there's another wonderful, often quoted example and that um, is when uh, Pradyumna Mishra, who was a very exalted Brahmin, came to Jagannath Puri desiring to hear topics of Krishna from Lord Chaitanya himself. But Lord Chaitanya directed him to hear those topics of Krishna from Ramananda Roy. Again, Ramananda Roy was not a Brahmin. He was born again in a lower Kayasta or Sudra family. But yet he and Surabdamada were none other than um, Lalita and Vishaka Sakis, most confidential associates of Sri Radha and Lord Krishna. So Mahaprabhu said to Prajumna Misra, Whatever I know about Krishna, I've learned from Ramananda Roy. You better go and talk to him. And, and Prajumna Misra did that. So uh, these wonderful examples are there in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Haridas Thakur, of course, very famous as well, born in a non-Hindu family. Uh, so, and the medicine does work, irregardless of our birth. Uh, everyone knows it. If you get sick, you go to a qualified doctor and you get some medicine. And if you take it according to his or her directions, then in, hopefully the medicine in time has its effect and we're cured. From memory, Prabhupada would sometimes pronounce English words in his own unique and delightful Bengali way. And on, on one occasion, he used the word quack and quoted it as quark, which I always sound really amusing because a quark is a deep black hole somewhere in the universe, right? <laughs> so I always like Prabhupada's pronunciation of quack as quark. Anyhow, getting back to medicine, so uh, yes, we see, and many of us uh, have been practicing Krishna consciousness under the uh, watchful gaze of his divine grace for decades now. We know it is a very, it, the medicine works if we take it according to the directions, and so much direction or instruction is there. And it has a very wonderful effect. We get cured of our material disease. Enechi asodi maya naso bari lagi. Bhakti Mino Thakur has sung, I've brought, in the, in the words of Lord Chaitanya, I've brought the medicine for destroying the illusion of maya. Now pray for this Hari Nam Maha Mantra and take it. 
That is wonderful medicinal advice there. Um, I have to admit I don't know very much about Sanskrit grammar, even though this verse, Prabhupada, this purport rather, um, I'm taking a leaf out of Ambika's book in the sense that some weeks back she also had a verse which just where Prabhupada went into some detail about astrology. And Ambika admitted right from the word go that I know nothing about astrology. So she didn't attempt to speak anything about it. So I'm what to speak of Sanskrit grammar. I, I barely know English grammar, but uh, still we'll try and find a few more things to say. <laughs> uh, in this regard, Prabhupada does mention uh, that it takes 12 years uh, to study and master Sanskrit grammar. And there is uh, a very famous verse amongst Vaishnavas um, attributed to Sripad Shankaracharya. And that is Bajagovindam, 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 Mudha, Mate, San Prapti, Sanihiti, Pahi, Nahi, Nahi, Raksha, Dukrina, Karine. And it's. it's documented that on his deathbed, Sri Shankaracharya, he said to his disciples who were caring for him, just worship Govinda, just worship Govinda, just worship Govinda. Your word juggery and mental speculation will not save you at the time of death. So a very powerful message from the leader of the Mayavadis, uh, Sri Shankaracharya, who of course is a partial expansion of Lord Shiva that um, this word juggery, Veda Vata Rata, juggling the prefixes and the suffixes of Sanskrit words to, to, to uh, squeeze out some alternative meaning uh, is really a waste of time. And uh, Prabhupada always took exception to scholars and followers of uh, Mayavad philosophy for not presenting Krishna's words uh, directly. And of course he would zone in regularly on the famous verse uh, where Krishna says to Arjuna, uh, just become my devotee. Surrender to me, offer your obeisances to me, worship me. Being fully absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. And I think in that verse... Uh, at least five or six times in the first person, Krishna says, me. Uh, what is the first line of the Sanskrit? Anyone can remember off the top? Just the first, yeah, what was that, a little louder? Man mana bhava mad bhakto majaji mam namaskuru, yes. So... Um, Prabhupada, uh, yeah, took a lot of exception to that. Um, very difficult to... And for that reason, Shankaracharya never commented on Srimad Bhagavatam because it's practically impossible to twist out an alternative meaning from the, um, the Srimad Bhagavatam than uh, the aspiration for pure devotion to the Lord, the personality of Godhead. So I might, I have one other, uh, I, I didn't tell, the, I haven't told this story for a long time. It's been a few years. But I know I, it, great, it gave a little bit of pleasure uh, to my dear God brother Vasa Strestha Prabhu uh, when I told it. And, um, and so I'm going to tell it again because uh, uh, I know he enjoyed hearing it. And I'm sure he hasn't forgotten it, but I, because he's got a very good memory, unlike myself. And it ties in a little bit here. So, once upon a time, long, long ago, there was a very pious king whose kingdom was in the foothills of the Himalayas. And this very good king would like to travel from time to time throughout his kingdom, as kings are meant to do, um, to make sure all of his citizens were upholding the principles of Sanat and Dham, that rogues and thieves were not gaining in, in prominence. 
So he came to one town um, in his kingdom and he stayed there for some days. And he was given a very nice house to, uh, to stay in during his time there. And the king was an early riser and he noticed uh, that there was one yogi in that town who would come every evening and proceed to enter the river of that uh, flowing through that town and he would meditate all night up to his neck and it was in the foothills of the Himalayas so it was a very cold river year round but nonetheless yogis are accustomed uh, to performing such austerities and uh, after meditating all night uh, the king observed in the morning at dawn uh, the yogi would come out of the river and then he'd go back into the forest to his hermitage. So the king was fascinated by this. And he asked uh, the local people, who is this yogi? And they explained that uh, he, he performs this austerity, he says, for all of our benefit. He's not doing it for himself, but uh, our town is flourishing. Everyone's very happy here. Uh, we have our crops always seem to flourish, the cows are happy, we have abundant milk. So he says he's performing these austerities for our benefit. So the king became even more impressed. And uh, he wanted to reward this yogi. Uh, he wanted to give as kings can do, they have treasuries and treasurers. So he decided I'm going to give this yogi some gold mm -hmm. uh, to do with as he wills. So uh, the problem was the king's treasurer was a very envious person who wasn't very pious and didn't really have much faith in sadhus and yogis and devotees. He actually saw the king's treasury as his own treasury and was always uh, reluctant to agree to the king's charity when he thought uh, in his mundane estimation that it wasn't uh, worthwhile. So um, he suggested to the king that uh, I think this yogi is fraudulent because I see that when he comes down to the river at night and enters the water, actually nearby was across the river and some distance away, there is a temple which has an enormous giwik which burns all night. So I think this yogi is actually drawing some heat from this ghee lamp and in this way is warming his body so he doesn't freeze to death. So this was presented uh, when the king finally had an opportunity. Um, there was some, this, this became a little bit of a controversy, a little controversial. And um, this, this came to the, to the attention of the yogi, who didn't actually want the gold or was not interested. But anyway, when he heard of this, that the king is very, very much uh, impressed and very grateful to you, uh, as are the townspeople. Uh, this town is in his kingdom. Everything's going nicely by your very selfless, austere sacrifice. But still his minister uh, treasurer is thinking, yeah, you know, getting some heat from somewhere else. So the yogi said, all right, uh, my dear king, uh, you come tomorrow morning and I'll cook breakfast for all of you. And I'm a very good cook. So that was arranged the next morning. They all came. Um, and there was the yogi and he was dressed as cooks do. Uh, for action and there were fires here and there and there were pots and there was boga in the pots and everything seemed to be going on. Um, at the time the king normally took his breakfast um, but uh, the yogi said just a few minutes more everything will be cooked. Um, so some time went by uh, and then some more time elapsed and eventually uh, the king was really getting hungry, as was his entourage, who normally ate with him. So, but they had all by that time seen that there was a major discrepancy. 
the pots were on tripods and the pots were high up on the tripods, a long way from the fire. Fire was here, pots up there. So it wasn't cooking, it wasn't getting cooked. So the yogi, this was like when the penny dropped, as they say, the yogi explained, especially to the envious treasurer, that this is your proposition, that I am somehow or other getting some heat uh, from this flame which is so far removed. Uh, so they all understood. And still the king, so the king became even more impressed. He gave the yogi some gold, much to the displeasure of the treasurer. And of course that yogi, he gave that gold. He had one friend who was, um, had a uh, goshala. He, his friend was also very pious and looked after a lot of cows. And uh, he gave that gold to him because the yogi didn't need much. He said, I, I get fruits and roots from the forest and my friend, he gives me some milk sometime. So I really don't, uh, I really don't need this gold. So I'll give it to my, my friend. Uh, he can use it, uh, utilize it in the service of, of the cows. And he did that. So of course the moral of the story is we do have to place ourselves in the fire of Krishna consciousness to really get the benefit. And we're starting a new year, and some of us, I'll only speak for myself, I'm really going to try this year to elevate myself, my consciousness, a little bit from uh, being a lukewarm neophyte to becoming a little more fired up about this Krishna consciousness because time is racing away. Um, so that can be... That will be my New Year's resolution anyway, um, get into the fire of Krishna consciousness. Because there is so much nectar to be had, but uh, Maya, of course, is cheating us uh, regularly. The famous Abhinatmika and Pratshipatmika Shaktis of Maya, one pulling us down and then the other one covering us over, or the other way around. We get covered over and then we get pulled down. But... Um, and we miss out. We miss out on this uh, wonderful opportunity. So I'll stop there, everyone. Any questions, comments, Ram Prashad I don't know if we have a second Bhakta mic this morning. Uh, otherwise, I can try. Oh, yes, Vishnu Jan's just now coming. We might just hold fire, Ram, and see if we, uh, we can uh, broadcast uh, all around. Let's see. You remember that story about Sestresta Prabhu? You like that story, right? He died. I knew he liked that story. Um, Hare Krishna. Thank you for class, Prabhu. That was really nice. Um, just furthering on from your treatise on, on cooking and heat, uh, I just read recently where Prabhupada said, chanting inattentively is like trying to cook with smoke. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Chairing inattentively. I beg your pardon. Chanting inattentively is like trying to cook with smoke. I like that. I'll try and lock that away. There will be some effect, but it will take a very, very long time. <laughs> very long time. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Jai Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki.
This is a song composed by Govind Das, a great poet and Vaishnava. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that if you have your mind controlled, then your mind is the best friend. But if your mind is uncontrolled, then he is your greatest enemy. So we are seeking after friend or enemy. Both of them are sitting with me. If we can utilize the friends of the mind, then we are elevated to the highest perfectional stage. But if we create mind as my enemy, then my path to hell is clear. Therefore, Govinda Das Thakur is addressing his mind. The yogis try to control the mind by different gymnastic process. That is also approved. But it takes a long time and sometimes there are failures. In most cases there are failures. Even a big yogi 